Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at vitamin B12 absorption and function. And we might talk a little bit about B9 as well, also known as folate. Let's take a look. All right, so to begin, let's orientate ourselves. We have the distal or lower portion of the esophagus going into our stomach. That moves into our duodenum, first part of the small intestines, where we have our pancreas squirt some stuff in, I'll talk about that in a sec, move through to the very distal portion or the end of our small intestines, termed the ileum, and here's one of the cells, the epithelial cells or mucosal cells at the ileum. We need to talk about how the B12 can get from here into this cell and from that cell into the bloodstream, and then we'll talk about what B12 does. So let's begin with ingesting B12. Where do we get B12 from? That is a great question, Michael. So B12, we can get from animal sources. Now, animal sources can include, you know, milks and cheeses and eggs and meats, things like that. We can't get them from plant products. Can we get them from plant products? And the answer is a big no. So that is very important clinically for people who might be vegetarians or vegans because if they don't supplement with B12, they may develop a deficiency in B12. And as we're soon gonna find, B12 is important for DNA, maturation and development. And that's a problem for our red blood cells. We'll get back there in one sec. So let's first talk about the B12 that we are ingesting in our food. So we bring B12 in from the food that we eat. So here's B12, and the B12 is going to be, like I said, in the food. So it's just gonna be surrounded by all this foodstuffs. Now, thankfully, we have a number of cells in our stomach. We have what's called chief cells, and we've got what's called parietal cells, and they release some really important things for us to help break down that foodstuffs. So chief cells help us produce ultimately pepsin that breaks down the proteins. Parietal cells help us by producing hydrochloric acid that makes the environment pretty uncomfortable for those proteins and they unfold. And then what that leaves us is with the B12. Now we don't want, the B12, it's not like it's immune to the proteases. So these are the molecular scissors that help chop up proteins. And it's not immune to the acid, so it needs to be protected. Now, thankfully, through our salivary glands, so our salivary glands will produce a really important protein. This important protein I'm gonna draw like this. And its name is, well, it's got three different names, right? You can call it haptocorin, you can call it R protein, if I learn how to spell and draw at the same time, or, so you can call it haptocorin, you can call it R protein, or you can call it trans cobal Amen. one Now, why would you call it transcobalamin-1? Because another name for B12 is cobalamin. So B12 is also known as cobalamin. So we've got haptocorin produced predominantly by our salivary glands, but can also be produced by our gastric glands, such as our chief cells, right? So it can also be produced through our gastric glands, what it does is when it sees that B12 is free, it says, don't worry my friend, I will protect you, and surrounds B12 and protects it. Importantly, our parietal cells are also going to produce something. It's also going to produce something called intrinsic factor. Let's write it as IF. And I'm gonna draw intrinsic factor like this. There's intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor really wants to bind to B12, but it can't for two reasons. One, the haptocorin 
It's got there first. It got there either in the oral cavity or down here in the stomach. And two, hydrochloric acid is inhibiting intrinsic factor from binding. Intrinsic factor can't bind in acidic environments. That's important. So now what we have are these two structures moving through. We're moving from the stomach now into the duodenum. We know that our pancreas here produces a number of really important things. One important thing that it produces, it, well, the, are the enzymes for digestion. Pro, proteases, lipases, uh, amylases, breaking down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Let's just look at the proteases. So it releases proteases. So these are gonna be like Pac-Man or scissors. And it releases hydrochloric, uh, it releases bicarbonate. And bicarbonate is important because it neutralizes hydrochloric acid. So when it become, when the acidity moves from the stomach into the intestines, we don't want that acidity in, the, acidity in the intestines. It'll damage the walls of the intestines. So we neutralize it through bicarbonate. So both of these chemicals are released from the pancreas into the duodenum. Importantly, let's start with the proteases. What the proteases will do is that it will chop off the haptochorin. So we've got the Pac-Man here, and it chops away the haptochorin. So that's gone. Because the bicarbonate has neutralized the environment, it now allows for the intrinsic factor to bind. And that's due to the bicarbonate, neutralizing bicarbonate plus acid. Perfect, what does that give us? Bicarbonate plus acid gives us H2CO3, which splits apart to, before, to form carbon dioxide and water. So it's neutralized the acid. All right, now we've got B12 bound to that beautiful intrinsic factor that always wanted to bind to it. It then travels through our digestive tract, our small intestines, until it gets to the most distal portion of our small intestines called the ileum. Here we have ileal cells. Here's our B12. And here is our intrinsic factor. And these ileal, epithelial, or mucosal cells, they have receptors for intrinsic factor. So the intrinsic factor will bind to the receptors and that will result in the process of endocytosis, sucking it in to the mucosal cell. So now inside the cell we have B12 with the intrinsic factor. Now through a process that has not been well elucidated, we don't really know what's going on, the B12 and the intrinsic factor part ways. But the B12 can't remain alone. So the B12 needs to bind to something else. And that something else that it binds to is not called haptochorin or our protein or transcobalamin 1 it binds to something that's called transcobalamin 2. And transcobalamin 2 is important because on the other side of the cell, you've got transcobalamin receptors. And this allows for now the exocytosis of B12 with the transcobalamin 2 attached. And that floats through our circulation and gets to the tissues. The B12 with the transcobalamin is the functional form of B12. Not B12 alone, not B12 bound to um, haptochorin or transcobalamin 1, not B12 bound to intrinsic factor, but B12 bound to transcobalamin 2 in the B12 transcobalamin 2 complex. Hollow transcobalamin it's sometimes referred to. This is the functional form. So once it gets to the tissues, what happens? Well, we need B12 for DNA maturation. We need it for DNA. Well, you could argue both DNA synthesis and DNA maturation.
Now, how does this work? It's complex, but I'm gonna make something complex a little bit easier. Let's first start with this. We know that we need glucose in our cells, and we need that glucose to turn into glucose 6-phosphate. That's the first step of glycolysis. Glucose turns to glucose 6-phosphate. Now that glucose 6-phosphate, through a multitude of steps, will ultimately turn into pyruvate, and then that will turn into acetyl-CoA, and blah, 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 and it all turns into ATP at the end. But there's alternate pathways here. We don't always want to turn that glucose 6-phosphate down through the glycolytic pathway in Krebs cycle and so forth. We can turn that glucose 6-phosphate into ribose 5-phosphate. And that ribose 5-phosphate is very important for creating what's called the nitrogenous bases. The nitrogenous bases. These are the bases that ultimately form DNA. So these include things like adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, uracil. These are the nitrogenous bases that we need to make DNA. Now, in order for ribose 5-phosphate to ultimately turn into these purines and pyrimidines, or the nitrogenous bases for DNA synthesis, we need an important B vitamin. What do you think that B vitamin is called? It's called B9. It's not B12, it's B9. B9. B9 has another name, folate. Let's write it here. B9 is also known as folate. It also, it's, but folate needs to be turned into its functional form, which is THF. THF is tetrahydrofolate. THF. We need B9 in the form of THF for this process to happen because THF is really good at transferring carbons and we need that process of transferring carbons for, for this to occur. But here's the thing about transferring carbons, is that it gets, THF gets a whole bunch of carbons handed to it by other molecules. So for example, you might have an amino acid wandering around the place, and this amino acid might be methylated. It might have a methyl group. A methyl group is one carbon with three hydrogens. So that's a methyl group. THF, because it loves Carbons, right? Let's say we've got our THF here, all happy, about to travel over so it can make DNA, but this amino acid says, hey, hold up a second, I know that you like methyl groups because it's got a carbon on it. I'm going to give it to you. And this amino acid loses its methyl group. But what does tetrahydrofolate obtain? It obtains a methyl group. It's now called methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, now you might think, who cares? Well, this traps tetrahydrofolate. It can't be used up here now. So this is what we call the tetrahydrofolate or THF trap. What do we do? We can't make DNA. That's our demise. However, luckily for us, we've got B12. And what B12 will do is B12 comes along and says, oh, my friend, what is the problem? Oh, you've got that methyl group. Don't worry, man. I'll take it from you. And B12 takes the methyl group from it. And it says, go forward and prosper, my friend. And now THF can thankfully undergo DNA synthesis. So B12, through this process, allows for DNA synthesis to occur with THF, tetrahydrofolate. Now you might think what happens here? Well, the B12 can give that methyl group off. It can take an amino acid like homocysteine, right? Give it the methyl group and it becomes methionine. And then that B12 is replenished again, as in the methyl group is off. Why do we need methionine? Because what methionine can do is a couple of things. Methionine can help in synthesizing thymine, but methionine is also really important for DNA methylation. 
And DNA methylation helps regulate DNA. It helps in things like gene transcription. Now let's think about this together. If we don't have any B9 or any B12, or at least not enough, DNA synthesis and DNA methylation cannot occur. Methylation, not only for gene transcription, but also DNA maturation, which is a loaded term, it means a whole bunch of things. And if we don't have B9 and B12, this can't occur. Now you might think, but all the cells of our body need DNA synthesis and maturation to occur. That's true. But there's going to be some cells that are more sensitive to this. These are the cells that are produced in high quantities very quickly, like our red blood cells. We make 2 million red blood cells every second. So they're very sensitive to any small disruptions in DNA synthesis and maturation. And therefore, if you don't have enough B12 or B9, you can get an anemia that forms. So we don't have enough functional red blood cells because the DNA synthesis and maturation isn't occurring. All right? If you don't have B12, specifically, you can get a what's called a megaloblastic anemia. So if you don't have, where am I going to put all this? Let's just do a little breakout box here, right? So if you don't have... B9 or B12, you can get an anemia, which is called a megaloblastic. I'm going to have to make it a bigger breakout box. Megaloblastic anemia. It just means really big. Why do they get really big? Because the DNA can't condense properly. That's part of the maturation synthesis process. So they just become big, immature red blood cells that don't work very well. Think about this as well. Look at intrinsic factor. If we don't have any intrinsic factor, it can't bind to B12 and can't get absorbed. That's effectively working like a B12 deficiency, right? So if you don't have any intrinsic factor, then you also get an anemia, but that's got a specific name. That's called a pernicious anemia. All right. And this is why B9 and B12, particularly B12, is really important to understand its absorption, metabolism and function. I'm Dr. Mike. Hope that helped. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.